Kelly Stanton. I'm manager of the Internet Project at the University of Waterloo. I welcome you here today. I'm so pleased that people have come out on Halloween and uh, do partake in our uh, our uh, uh, devil's bag back there as the thing is being uh, circulated. We're delighted that you could come here today for our second presentation in the uh, Smarter Health Seminar series. Uh, this series is a joint effort between the Internet Project and the Education Program for Health Informatics Professionals, and they're both at the University of Waterloo. Our agenda today will begin with a few comments from David Johnson. Thank you very much, uh, Shirley. The first thing I want to do is to express the uh, deep appreciation of all of us to you and Don and Dominic for being such wonderful smart folks in making this series possible and doing so much imaginatively and energetically and enthusiastically to uh, help with uh, our university leadership in so many creative areas, this being one. Uh, the second thing I want to say is how important and pivotal I see this series of lectures, uh, Smarter Health, the Value of IT in the Health System. Uh, Dr. John Steiner will be speaking to us today, uh, how lucky we are to have a person of his distinction coming to help us uh, to uh, find an appropriate way for us to add value to this uh, emerging world. Just look at the series of guests that we'll have for the patient, John Oliver, with us, the diagnosis of John Steiner, the treatment, Craig Lehman, prescription, the prognosis, the follow-through, and a case study, a, a wonderful tour de raison of uh, smarter health and the value of IT in the health system. What is especially important is the capacity to integrate um, knowledge, uh, and that's a, a message for our time. Think of those three, four letter words, Adam, Chip, and Code, that summarize so much of what is happening and how important it is to have integrators of this knowledge. And in information technology for the health system, of course, we see the challenge of integration uh, placed uh, so squarely before us. And a rather vivid example of this, uh, I'm not sure Jan and Dominic and Shirley and Don know why I was called away for uh, at the lunch we were having. My wife was thrown from the horse and was cracked four ribs. Uh, and uh, fortunately is fine. Uh, I have to know my children to know my wife. Uh, she got back up and rode the ruddy horse for another 15 minutes just to establish what was running and her ribs x-rayed and she's, uh, she's now uh, uh, in the recovery room and, uh, and en route. Uh, but it, that's a traumatic event and one deals with it with the kind of traumatic concern a good husband has. But I, as I was waiting for it to come out the x-ray room, I was struck about how still paper-driven our, our hospitals are um, with the, the best will in the world with those good people. Uh, the human uh, features of this little encounter could not have been more exemplary, more thoughtful, more decent, more sensible. But my heavens, uh, the systems that they have to work with uh, just boggle the mind, including uh, now that she got the x-rays and we examined them together with a very fine uh, radio graphic technician and, and the doctor could identify the places, etc. You know, they had to wait for the films to come and put them up and uh, we go on them and do it all by high and then wait for copies to be made so that she could take them across the just across the street to her family doctor's office so that he would at least have the x-rays there and transcribed electronically. He could then follow her. If particular treatment now would be largely pain killer she's dealing with, with this trauma. But it illustrates again and each of us has a story we can tell that if we could just work a little bit smarter in our health system, we would improve dramatically the quality of care and the efficiency of the system. We spend $80 billion a year in Canada, as you know, on health care. If we just take 1% of that and dedicate it to smarter IT health, we'd be so much further ahead. But of course, to do that, we need the leadership. We need the creative, thoughtful, imaginative, integrating people who can bring us across those silos. And that's what we're about in this series, is creating developing, empowering that kind of talent, and having the research and ideal leadership which permits it all to happen. Um, I'm just delighted that uh, we have this series, and uh, I cannot uh, say how thrilled we are with Dr. Steiner with us today, and uh, the other guests that uh, Shirley and Don and Dominic have arranged for us. So let's get on with the integrator. I've known uh, Dr. Steiner uh, from when I was in graduate school, which is too long ago to tell any of you. He also knows my wife from when she was in medical school, which is even earlier than that. He's been around a very long time. I've actually waited, I guess, about, what, 35 years for the opportunity to introduce you. Uh, we had the ch chance to work together and had a great deal of fun together, but um, I can introduce him in many ways. Uh, he's actually a great scientist. He did uh, work in a number of fields. He's a pathologist. He has 
an unbelievable understanding of health informatics, even though he's not involved or trained in computer science, and was relating to me all kinds of things he was doing uh, related to modeling of the laboratory. His area of specialization right now is the laboratory. And you probably couldn't find a speaker known by more people, particularly in the United States and Canada, than he, uh, because of his involvement, laboratory medicine, is able to come to new levels of organization and uh, huge savings can result from the techniques he's put in place. And we'll talk maybe at the end a little bit about that if you're asking some questions. There's another side of Dr. Steiner after knowing him for so many years, and it's the chance to get even. So what I did was put together a little introduction more in keeping with the kind of introduction I typically do. I have a series of pictures I took over those 35 years that I would like to share with you and uh, you know, let you really know the Dr. Steiner that I know. The first is a picture, he's a very good argue, and very argumentative person, very good debater, but when you need to convince him of something, this is a picture of Dr. Steiner actually being persuaded. <laughs> and uh, I didn't even win that argument, I have to tell you that. So I have some others that I'd like to show you. One is, he has had to face the consequences. He's, a, he's a absolutely, uh, no well-known speaker, and he doesn't even need to promote himself. He promotes himself, of course, because he's a consultant, selling himself. This is a picture of a recent encounter with one of the women pathologists at a hospital. He says, you told me on the phone that you were a six-footer. <laughs> <laughs> Early in his medical career, of course, Dr. Steiner wanted to be a, a doctor from the time he was a child. This slide takes a little bit of reading, but this is a picture very early in his life when he was still a child back in Czechoslovakia. And uh, these two sides are billing records here on the side. It says, how many times have I told you not, not to play doctor? <laughs> <laughs> he did do some informatics study, and we actually captured a picture of him as he did a course in health informatics. <laughs> Healthcare administrators across the country actually quake in their boots when Dr. Steiner's name is mentioned in their hospital. And we were lucky enough to capture a picture of a, of a healthcare administrator who was told that Dr. Steiner was visiting his institution and had an insight. He said the consultants here with an insight and said, send them in anyway. <laughs> <laughs> he does produce many reports, some of which are actually believed. This is a picture of is actually giving a report here, a verbal report. It's a consult report utilizing the available data. He says it's raining. Very, very good cross section of you, and I hope you enjoyed it. The uh, the real talk, though, uh, that we put together here is a serious one, and it relates to the issues in information, which is the lifeblood in the health environment, really being not as accessible as we think it is. In fact, that we're deluged with information that we think is valuable, but in order for it to be valuable, it really needs to be available to human beings, it needs to be able to be understood by them. Dr. Steiner will talk to us today in, in that area. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm a pathologist by profession and avocation. Um, and my specialty is clinical pathology, that is laboratory medicine. Um, I just I, I want to just tell you at the beginning why I emigrated from Canada to the United States some 20 years ago. Uh, my reason my reason was a very simple one. I was asked by the government of Ontario to examine the question: Does every hospital need to have a laboratory? And uh, if not, why not? And what would the alternative be? Um, I was paid a handsome sum of money for, for, for producing a report which suggested that A, not every hospital needs a laboratory and B, one could deliver first class laboratory care uh, services by integrating or consolidating multiple hospital laboratories into single units uh, leaving on site only a what we call a rapid response laboratory one which could have a turnaround time of tests in a roughly uh, 15 to 20 minutes um, and uh, in that report I recommended that in order to make that happen hospitals should be able to offer services to communities beyond just the walls of the hospital 
and there was a reason for it which I'll be explaining in this, in this presentation. Um, to my dismay, and at that time, by the way, there was a new democratic government in, in Ontario, and to my dismay, I was told, no, we can never implement this report because we will not allow our hospitals to compete in the private sector against uh, the commercial laboratories, which I had a huge vested interest in continuing to do this work. Um, and I decided on the strength of that to leave because I felt in, that in the United States, the idea of uh, uh, what, I, what I'll be showing you about continuity of care in laboratory services uh, was essential and that the, there was a, a tremendous misdeed done to us all by allowing commercial laboratories to deliver laboratory services in competition with hospitals. Um, so I decided to go to the United States and found in a very good reception and built a large uh, consulting company on the basis of the concept of, that I failed to convey to the government of Ontario. The other point I want to make is that Laboratory medicine is on the verge of a huge revolution and just to measure, give you a measure of what I'm talking about is uh, it took about between 50 and 80 years to get from about 15 tests that we used to have. When I went to medical school, we had about 15 tests. Most tests used to be done by interns um, uh, to about 1,300 tests, which is a total of clinical laboratory tests on the menu of the largest institutions in the country. This took somewhere between 70, 80 years to develop from say 15 to 18 up to 1300. We anticipate that in the next five years we'll go from 1300 to close to 7000 and in the next three years from about 1300 to 5000 which means a huge volume of new information which previously didn't exist. This is a result of the International Genome Project which uh, is enabling us now to characterize genetic changes in a way which wasn't possible before, which has enormous importance. I really can't go into details of this at this moment, but it is of huge importance because it will enable us to do things which were absolutely impossible up to now. As an example, being able to forecast with accuracy whether a given drug will or will not achieve its specific goal. Uh, in other words, now, the argument now in the United States about how to treat anthrax that argument will be a moot argument in the future because we'll be able to tell exactly whether a particular patient will respond to Cipro or will respond to another antibiotic uh, better than Cipro. So uh, th that's a real revolution which is in, in the offering and it's an informational revolution because it will generate huge volumes of data. My vision of what I call regionalization of hospital laboratory services was based on, 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 a, on a concept that, that multi-institutional ventures coordinated to eliminate undue duplication of resources would be beneficial to both patients and economically. I, I felt that by sharing expertise amongst multiple hospitals that the quality of, of this laboratory service and the technology transfer that would result from it would be better. Remember that if you go in, into a city like this, there may be one hospital that has a PhD in chemistry running the chemistry department and there may be 15 other hospitals that don't have such resource and so by sharing that intellectual resource you can dramatically improve the quality of laboratory services. Uh, now remember that much of what I'm saying is tainted by the American environment in which I live and some of the words I use may be somewhat difficult to understand but client responsiveness is uh, one of the things that we felt that we, if you created these regional programs that patients would have a much better relationship to the, to the laboratories. We, we believe that as a result of that one could create uniform terminologies, normal val values and ranges for tests which would be equal for every patient no matter where that patient was. That there would be in, in integrated information systems uh, uh, in a compatible regional database so that there would be cradle to grave care in, included so a patient would, have, would be able to carry an electronic card which would have on it all that patient's laboratory profile for cradle to grave which is absolutely essential and cannot be done at this moment. That there would be an, uh, a shared infrastructure for, 
for outreach, which, as I said, was impossible in Canada, but in the United States it meant that the hospitals could go out and share courier systems, uh, what we call client service systems, billing systems, um, and communication systems for physicians throughout a particular region, that there would be a unified operational philosophy which was attuned to the clinical goals of the physicians in, in a given area, that there would be uh, standardized equipment, methodologies and procedures in all the institutions participating in a regional laboratory program, that there would be in common medical, technical and administrative leadership, in common purchasing so that they will all be buying the same kinds of supplies which are critical in laboratory medicine, and dedication to innovation which would be an, a, a basic philosophy for developing these programs. The goals then were to to produce seamless delivery of laboratory services, equal, equal patient access to high quality services so that throughout the region the highest standard of the best practices could be achieved and patients would have access to the best no matter where they were in that particular region, that there would be continuity of care, meaning that the underpinning of data um, and information about the patient's disease characterized by the laboratory information would be interpretable by all the clinical users in the region as a unified system of data, that there would be regional purchasing, which I already mentioned, that there would be a reduction in fixed costs because by sharing these resources there would be significant economies of scale, which we have now proven to be true, that there would be a low cost structure and competitive pricing so that they could go out and compete with the commercial laboratories and offer the services to the entire region, not just to the hospitals, that they could institutionalize technological innovation and technology transfer. You have no idea how dysfunctional the system is currently. That there will be joint bidding on managed care contracts which in the United States are extremely important. That there would be services developed first, what that we call in-reach services, that is that doctors that are affiliated with a given hospital would send their testing from their offices to the, to, the lab, to the hospital laboratory and that in due course it would be go from what we call in-reach to outreach, that is to physicians who are not necessarily affiliated with the hospital so that the entire region would be covered by, the, by an identical laboratory system. When I left Canada I, um, I was uh, very concerned about the dysfunctional system that we had and I called it the Tower of Babel Syndrome, I published this uh, and it's been repeatedly republished by others in which I showed if you had four hospitals they would be using different reference laboratories. They could not talk to each other because they use different methods, different methodologies, different uh, ways of testing for a given electrolyte, a given analyte. In fact, they could not communicate to each other because even the names of tests would be different from hospital to hospital. On top of it, they would use different reference laboratory for complex or expensive tests. They would, the nursing homes in the region would use different reference laboratories. Physician offices with laboratories, the poles, would use different hospitals and different reference laboratories. And physician offices and physicians in practice would all use different sources of laboratory testing. So nobody could talk to anybody. And it seemed at that time almost impossible to solve that. There was a simple model that I was advocating should be created. That is that hospitals should band together, create a core laboratory that would do most of the what we call time non-sensitive testing that, is turn, that could be turned around, turned around in say four hours. That at each hospital there would be a rapid response laboratory, rapid service laboratory that could turn around tests within less than an hour say and everything else would go to the core laboratory and that the core laboratory would not only serve the four hospitals in the region but the nursing homes, the physician offices, the physician offices with, labo with uh, laboratories and there would be a single reference laboratory so that all of the results would be totally compatible for every patient cradle to grave within the region. To me that made such eminent sense I couldn't see how that wouldn't be a, a major advantage. In fact in practice what has happened in the United States now I'm not sure that this shows well enough but is that we have now got about um, 200 of these kinds of systems that we have been 
able to create where there is a core laboratory associated with one hospital. You have four hospitals that, uh, that um, have rapid response laboratories in them. And then there is a separate organization called the Outreach Core, which provides services through hospitals to their physicians, which are these, these um, prickles, prickles which stick out from each hospital. They are the physicians that are affiliated with that hospital, and the Outreach Core provides the basic infrastructure to spread the services into the region beyond each hospital. Now, we, we know now for the first time that this works and uh, it works very effectively. So the, uh, the hospital sends their specimens to the, lab co to the laboratory core and the outreach program sends out help to develop the outreach programs. The proof of the pudding is a, a recent publication by the federal government uh, of the United States, the o Office of uh, Healthcare Financing, which shows that for the first time as you see, in 1995, the commercial laboratories controlled the entire market for laboratory testing, 42% was it, I think? And they are down to 34%. And I arrived in the United States about 1970, and it took about 15 years to convince people that something should be done. Well, today, the hospitals are controlling 46 and I've actually, the forecast for, 19, uh, for 2002 is that it will be over 50% will be done by hospitals. So the hospitals have been able to penetrate this commercial sector and take the testing back into the hospitals and to create these integrated informational systems. This has been by, greatly helped by the discovery of uh, the interface engine and this was a diagram which many years ago Dominic produced and I've been uh, using as a, as a way of convincing people that none of this could be done without uh, the interface engine to link various hospitals together because it became very rapidly clear that one of the biggest problems we had in creating these kinds of regional programs was a disparate, what we call heterogeneous LIS systems which, which couldn't communicate with each other. The interface engine made it possible at that time we assumed that the interface engine would also provide the communication to the physician offices in a region. But the critical factors are in this oval here, the, the factors which we thought were essential for success. The, the first one was the specimen tracking system. If you create these regional programs, it's absolutely essential that you can track a given specimen at any time to know where it is so that if a doctor calls in and says, I want to know what Mrs. Uh, Jones's glucose is, that you can immediately track that specimen and tell him either the result is 100 milligrams per milliliter or that the test is in the process of being done will be ready in 15 minutes. So the specimen tracking system is a critical component of this. The global patient index so that a patient within the region can be ident identified by a unique uh, designation so that there are because the current hospital registration systems are very often incompatible with each other. So for laboratory purposes, we needed a separate global uh, patient index to be able to identify them individually and without any possibility of an error. And finally, we needed data warehouses systems to, with, through the interface engine that would request and store all laboratory-related data testing, financial and operational to support management, analysis, managed care reporting, and other, other analytical processes, which was difficult without the warehouses. And then we needed a clinical data repository that would integrate all clinical inf uh, information uh, to make it available to clinicians uh, to access in support of the patient care process. And finally, we needed a transaction management system that is a component of integration system that vectors, orders, results, records, and other data from a source to destination based on rules that can be revised as required and allows monitoring of system performance. That, at the time when this diagram was developed by Dominic, uh, didn't exist and was a, a critical um, part of the development of, a successful, of these successful programs in the United States. Uh, it was assumed that the cost effectiveness could be achieved by streamlining and automating laboratory processes and providing 
laboratory information system support to ensure accuracy and performance monitoring and speeding result transmission. That's the way in the, the uh, clinical laboratory effectiveness used to, be, used to be formulated in the past. The new paradigm was that overall cost effectiveness hinges not just on the appropriate uh, provision of a laboratory information system, but really depends upon appropriate test selection by the physician and sequencing and the presentation of results in a manner which facilitates clinical decision making at the right time. Um, in other words, the laboratory information system failed to provide the linkage with the physician and uh, I maintain that um, this is part of the fundamental change that we have gone through in the last very few years and going back a long time. There was in the early 40s and 50s there was the age of methodology in which the main emphasis was on developing new tests in the laboratory industry. Then we went to the age of in vitro diagnostic technology which was a period in uh, roughly the 50s and early 60s when machines were developed that would automatically process testing electronically. Uh, then, uh, and all of these things occurred concurrently as well as sequentially. And then, then came the period of data process technology which was the uh, introduction of the laboratory information systems which were primarily directed to uh, speed and automate the process of processing the samples that reach the laboratory. But, in, but the characteristic of all these three stages was that we were telling physicians what we were able to do and telling them this is our product, you use it to the best of your ability for diagnostic purposes. I believe that we have entered this new age of informatics at this juncture which really has changed everything, which for the first time we are saying the information we produce by however effective our laboratory operation is, is useless unless the physician knows what to do with that information or even knows how to obtain that information in an effective manner for clinical decision making. And so the usefulness of the data for the clinician and the physician is, has become in, come into very sharp focus and that is really what I call the age of informatics in, in laboratory medicine. The, the concept of course is based upon the assumption that what we generate in the laboratory is data. We, we generate huge masses of data which are totally disjointed. They, they are poured out and they are presented to the physician in a format which he cannot interpret. It's, it's an amazing thing. It's almost, it's almost antediluvial uh, the way it, it comes out. The, um, uh, the machines uh, that produce the testing, 90% of the testing is done at machine workstations where the machine has a certain sequence of producing the test. It will say it has a menu of 10 tests. It will produce one test, one, two, three, four, five, irrespective of whether there's any logic to it other than the, the technical logic of the machine processing. And this is the way the results are presented to the doctor. They come out in a sequence which is totally illogical medically, but it's very logical from a machine standpoint. What we need now is to really integrate these data for the clinician, and remember now, we have grown from 15 tests to 1,300 tests. Now, nobody orders 1,300 tests, but they will order 20 or 30 or 50 tests, and they suddenly get a report for 50 uh, test results listed in a, in a manner which the machine understands, but he, he or she has no idea what it means, and he's asked to sort through it and understand the meaning of, it, of the data. So what we need is information, and we need intelligent tools to facilitate this process, to make the transition from data to information. And then we need further assistance in making that information, to transforming that information into knowledge. And by that I mean integrating that laboratory information with other diagnostic information, radiology, electro, electro, electro diagnostics, uh, EKGs, EEGs, and so on, that would create knowledge that is more than simple information, but knowledge about the entire process of diagnosis and patient management required for patient ma management. So ultimately then the test of success of this system is that the, that the 
information and the data produced will contribute to the clinical application for decision making in managing a particular patient. I, I, I call this uh, info catenation. I, I've coined the term, nobody, nobody has used it other than myself, I think. But it, um, to me, it's really creating a chain of, cat, catena in Latin it means chain, and to me, it's really creating a chain of series of values that are clinically useful information rather than simply data and that uh, this will assist in the diagnostic and therapeutic decision-making process. Uh, just one more point I want to illustrate. All of us sort of think like we go to our doctor and by the way, what I'm saying is of importance to all of us because we are, I'm talking about patients. I'm talking all of us as potential patients. And it's awfully important to understand that doctors order tests without knowing what they are doing. It, it, it's a terrible indictment of our system and I, uh, I am very much aware of that, acutely aware of this. And I'll just give you an illustration. There was an article published in January of 2000 in the New England Journal of Medicine where a group of, um, of ophthalmologists looked at 19,000 cases, 19,556 cases of elective cataract surgery, which requires by regulation in the United States the, a whole set of tests, a battery of medical tests, laboratory tests, electrocardiography, blood count, and measurements of serum levels of electrolytes, urine, nitrogen, catheter, and glucose. What they found was that they looked at these 19,557 cases and that the routine medical testing before cataract surgery does not measurably increase the safety of the surgery. There wasn't a single case out of over 19,000 cases where there was a causal relationship between an abnormal test and a problem with the surgery. In other words, that set of tests, which in the United States costs about $150, $200, is totally unnecessary. I mean, to me, this was a seminal publication because since then there's been a whole, whole cascade of these demonstrating the uselessness of what physicians often do by rote because you are like programmed in medical school to this is what you do or when you are in your residency. In ophthalmology, you learn that this is what you do for every patient with a cataract and you do it blindly. Of course, I'll be probably disemboweled by the American Medical Association, but who cares? Uh, uh, so, just coming back, the, um, that I'm, I maintain that 70% of all clinical information is derived from the laboratory. That is not to, me, to say <coughs> that the value of that information represents 70% of the, of the contribution to the diagnostic or management process. It's just in volume, it's a huge volume, which is now going to quadruplicate and uh, uh, increase tenfold in the next very few years. And the question is, how, what do we do with that huge volume of information? And, and there is a, a statement that has been made repeatedly is about 60% of medical decisions are directly or indirectly dependent upon laboratory test results. I have, a, I have a feeling that the reason uh, for the physician's failure to, to understand laboratory me medicine well is partly due to the increasingly complex clinical environment in which they operate, and that there are more and uh, more faster communications channels which they have to deal with, that they, the care process interruptions by external overseers is very intense in the United States, particularly there are continual um, uh, people monitoring the physician's performance. There are often pre intrusive prior clinical documentation demands which are tremendous, a lot of paperwork involved in care. And the demand for higher clinical productivity which is being pushed by the managed care companies in the United States, all of these contribute to the fact that the physician is truly under pressure. I'm, I'm saying that so that they don't disembowel me uh, because I, I'm trying to find the reason why they are incapable of managing the system, although I think there is an inborn error of metabolism which is responsible. So in general, physicians do not know what, orders, what tests to order, how to appropriately sequence them, how to interpret large sets of data points when they receive them, and uh, how to aggregate data from other sources with the data 
obtained from the laboratories such as imaging, electrodiagnostic and so on to form an integrated information about the patient. The physician's process, just for, so that you understand my reasoning, really is a, is a well organized, I mean you learn this by rote and it's drilled into you for five, uh, four years in medical school. You take the history, you take a physical examination, you acquire knowledge of the, of the disease process and you, you factor in your experience into formulating a diagnosis and the treatment plan of that particular patient. The, the laboratory information is critical in that it confirms or rules out or suggests a diagnosis which may be optimal. It optimizes the choice and application of therapy, integration of laboratory data into the clinical workflow, constitutes the basis for cost-effective use of clinical laboratory data and information. The burden is to educate the physician in the appropriate use of constantly changing test methodologies in an environment of privacy and confidentiality. That is the best practices solution to achieve the optimal outcome. This currently is, that, that system is failing in my opinion, it is inadequate and as a former dean of a medical school I am absolutely convinced that the only way this will be cured is by computer assisted instruction. Physi physicians must be trained in decision making and it must not be assumed that certain people have the ability to make decisions well and others do not unassisted. Uh, that assumption is continually being made and I absolutely challenge that because I am convinced that this is not an inborn gift from God, that it's something that really we have got to help the physicians to learn. Now, there is a change occurring in our system which in the past the emphasis that we had in laboratories never to lose a specimen, never lose a specimen, perform the right test consistently, report results accurately in a timely fashion and provide reports on paper or by phone. That used to be the, the mantra of laboratories. The new system says uh, uh, that we must provide test method and process information for the physician, that we must provide cost information so the physician is aware of the cost. We know now from experiments that have been done that if you provide the physician online with information about cost of a particular test, he'll shy away from ordering an unnecessary test because it's expensive. There are risks attached to this because some doctors may shy away and miss in the process an important diagnosis but nevertheless the fact is that the, the experiments have shown that if you show them the, um, the cost that it, it, it certainly makes them think twice however the experiments have also shown the minute you stop showing that information they revert to type and order everything irrespective of cost so it's not, it's not a learning process it's just a, a passing um, uh, fancy the, uh, I was part of an experiment at uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston where we announced on a Friday that next Monday the computer screens on, which used to show the names of all tests which the doctor had to take and the paper orders which they had to fill in when they wanted to order tests would be blank and that they had to fill in the names of the tests they wanted to order. There was a, within the first week there was a 70% reduction in tests of orders because of course they couldn't remember the names of the tests uh, which, was, which proves to me proves the point that they don't know what to order. It's a, it's, it's a terrible indictment but um, it's a reality. Now I, 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 this is just one tenth of an algorithm and I produce this slide merely to illustrate how complex the process of decision making is as to what type of test to order. This, is, this was actually published in the New England Journal, I think it was. Uh, and uh, it, uh, it, it shows you the kinds of decisions that have to be made. Nobody can possibly remember all of this. I mean, it's a, this is a, this is a, used to, was on three pages, this algorithm, for, for dealing with cholesterol lowering drugs. And uh, nobody can possibly remember that. Uh, so, uh, it's clear to me that the only way to deal with this information is by computer and provided for the physician at his or her workstation. Um, I've been recently, by the way, visited uh, a, a system in, 
in Minneapolis which absolutely staggered me when people say doctors will never sit at a computer and, and uh, obtain information. There is a cardiology program uh, sponsored by a managed care company in Minneapolis where physicians actually have a the examination couch and next to it they have a desk with a, with a CRT on it and uh, the CRT is programmed to guide them through the process of interview of the patient and through the decision making process. And I was amazed to find that very erudite physicians, uh, specialists in cardiology, would sit there and religiously let themselves be guided by the computer in the process of making a diagnosis. It's possible even today, and I'm sure that as more and more computer savvy individuals will graduate from medical schools, this will become increasingly more possible. The, uh, this is uh, a very American remark this, uh, about the commercial laboratories doing a disservice. Uh, um, they were trying to sell, and by the way, I was a medical director of the largest Canadian um, um, uh, laboratory company, MDS, in Toronto for a number of years, and so I, uh, I saw the, the same kind of side, site or same kind of... Uh, uh, attitude in Canada, they have to sell testing, they've got to make money on testing, so they would s carry out various maneuvers to make the doctor order more. May I just use some examples? For example, they would say, uh, if you suspect a patient to have uh, anemia, don't just order a red blood cell count, order a CBC, which is a total process, uh, which costs about five times more and doctors would obviously order it or they, of, they ordered the test of thyroxine T3, T4 uh, when in fact one test it, it called uh, thyroid stimulating hormone would do the same job and do it much better. In the United States today nobody orders T3, T4 anymore. One test will do. But it took uh, almost a revolution to wean doctors from what the commercial laboratories have fed them on and which ob obviously brought in a lot of profit or they would ask for iron and ferritin for every patient with, with anemia or suspected anemia, which is totally unnecessary. Uh, it, it's a follow-up test, but they would, they would say it costs so little, it doesn't matter. But it did matter. It cost millions. In fact, m many of the large commercial laboratories in the United States were fined millions of dollars for, for this particular fraudulent practice. I won't belabor this, but I'm saying that in the future, the reports will have to look very different from the, what they look now. Specifically, we'll, we'll have to, instead of having the instrument-driven integration, which I mentioned to you, where the machine really tells them what, what uh, the findings are, that we'll have to have clinical problem-centered integration. So that if a patient is suspected diabetic, all the tests uh, which lead one to suspect or which are related to diabetes would be shown in a, in a single integrated uh, finding for the physician. So he would have, it would hit him in the face, this patient is a diabetic or is not a diabetic. He would, doesn't have to search through hundreds of results. Or there would be a horizontal integration that, so, that, uh, so that if you have an integrated delivery system in which there are multiple hospitals, that all the results from all the hospitals or clinics or doctors in that region would be on a single report. And that there would be a historical report showing trends so that you could find out, you know, how did the glucose in the diabetic behave over the last six months? This currently doesn't exist, but it's absolutely essential. This is to me informatics in practice uh, that needs to be developed now and quickly to make it effective. And then there's got to be vertical information integration to show the, all the diagnostic background information from whatever source derived on a single report form. form. The other very important point I want to make about informatics in laboratory medicine, if you talk to any physician, because the way the reports are formatted, what the reports say is, it, it says at the top usually, abnormal results are uh, highlighted in the following report. So what the doctor does, he goes down this list of 50 tests, and he looks at all those that are highlighted which are abnormal. In fact, many tests 
are extremely important if they are normal or if they are better than normal. Uh, in other words, you really have to look at every result of, of a sequence of tests to be able to make a, a sound judgment. And for that, you need multifactorial analysis which can integrate that information and display it in a way which truly relates all abnormal, normal, and better than normal results for the clinician in a, in a reasonable way. doesn't exist today. Uh, to me, it's absolutely essential for the future. So I, I'm saying that the best practices that we ought to strive for where informatics are critical to the whole process are, number one, assist the physician to identify necessary tests and uh, re eliminate redundant testing, which defies medical logic. Secondly, develop regional clinical data repositories to achieve continuity of laboratory care data compatibility and cradle-to-grave data coordination through data mining technology so that we can mine a patient's past data and in integrate them into a, a current report and to re-educate physicians to order only tests which are medically necessary, tests which meet the, the federal necessity guidelines which exist in the United States and uh, tests which are less costly so that they can, they, rather than ordering esoteric tests which are very expensive, they can order often routine tests which will do the job. I, I quoted here one of the leaders of computer application in laboratory medicine in the United States, um, uh, Bruce Friedman, who said that uh, under managed care, LISs are being integrated rapidly into the larger group of hospital-based clinical information systems. The LIS architecture of the future must certainly, most certainly will be web-based and it's happening now uh, with a vengeance. Everybody is uh, rapidly moving to a web-based communication system between the hospital-based uh, laboratory and the region to transmit test results quickly to off-site locations, to trans simultaneously to parties on a need-to-know basis so that, for example, patients can be informed of the results if it is appropriate capture and integrate test results from off-site point of care testing areas into a single patient report. We have now increasingly, we are seeing point of care testing using manually operated machines which have a turnaround time of 20 to 40 seconds for certain tests and very often these data do not get incorporated into the total testing record but most of them are now have transmission with infrared uh, ray technology which allows entry directly into the CRT transmit in, in, uh, images for physician interpretation, microbiology and electrophoresis, for example. The images often don't appear on the report, so the physician really cannot visualize what that report looks like, which is critical in that particular case. Permit online consultation so that the physician can ask questions about the report online and obtain uh, an immediate feedback. Provide data links to other sites and reference to the, to the, to the medicine literature. And again, a very important point because most physicians don't have either access or read enough of the literature to really be able to consult that literature quickly to understand the particular problem better than, than by just uh, relying on the education which took place 20 years before. And the linkage to the health centers, internet, intranet for PC and laptop access is, is another critical component of this equation. The way I see the future setup of laboratory services in a, I wish I had a pointer, but I, I'll try and just explain my concept here. That there are really three domains. Uh, now, this is particularly relevant for America. It, it really doesn't apply entirely here. We need an e-commerce, what I call an e-commerce domain, which falls into two, two sets, one at the top and one at the bottom. At the top, there is a the link to the physician office in which uh, we provide him with a global patient index so that uh, all the patients in that region are, have the, an identical number. The, he can generate the order, he can barcode the tubes that, that he collects through phlebotomy, through tapping the blood of the patient and for purposes of tra transmitting the order. We have to couple into that the necessity prompting at, at that level so that he is in fact informed 
which tests are necessary and which tests are unnecessary in relation to his suspected diagnosis. And we have got to provide him with diagnostic algorithms to prompt him on the best sequencing of tests, which is very important. What do you do if the result comes back positive? What's the next sequence of tests that you will order? Then the, in the, at, the, at the rear end of the process, we come back into this e-commerce domain where we, with a physician office LinkedIn, where we provide him rules-based routing. For example, the physician might be able to notify the laboratory, I'm going to a concert tonight. I would like you to contact me on my palm pager so that I, I can find out the result of that glucose before I leave the theater. Uh, this doesn't exist at the moment, but it's absolutely critical for the future and is relatively a simple solution. We've got to provide a multifactorial analysis of resu for result interpretation that I mentioned earlier. And we have got to have the ability to do data mining to be able to pr produce longitudinal displays for comparative analysis. In the middle of it is uh, what I call the LISH, uh, Laboratory Information System, Hospital Information System domain, in which we really monitor the accessioning process, a process which ensues when the specimen arrives in the laboratory, the aliquoting, which is the dividing of the specimen to be channeled to various workstations, the analysis of the work and the report generation, and ultimately ensuring the specimen is appropriately stored. We these data must then be tra transferred to a data warehouse and to the clinical data repository. And then in the United States, we have the problem of having a third domain, which is a business domain, in which we must provide all the data necessary for billing, collection, and statistical information production, which these managed care companies require. That's a kind of model that I think uh, is critical for the future. I'm sure Dominic would probably provide, produce this in a much more sophisticated manner, but that's at least the way I see that. All of this is now possible, by the way. The Tower of Babel that I started with was partly caused by the fact that computers couldn't really talk to each other adequately. And I believe that the development of these new languages, particularly the XML in the end, and the merger of SNOMED uh, with uh, uh, LOINC, the three top, uh, the, sorry, two, three, and four, into a single system, will make it possible now to, um, to really communicate uh, all of this in the system that originally uh, Dominic designed, which will ena enable us to really have a system that will be able to talk to each other in totally compatible language. And that's finally is, is really the basis of the common language now exists, so there is no excuse that we shouldn't be able to move into that into that ultimate development of uh, informatics. Thank you.